Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to Federation Hall. If you haven't met me, my name's David Zaquera and I'm the director of the Fiona and Sydney Meyer Gallery here. And I'm also the person who organises Art Forum. And just so you know where you are, you're in Federation Hall and this event is part of the Art Forum program. Art Forum happens every week and then occasionally we do an evening session which we call Art Forum After Hours. And um, that's where you are. You're in Art Forum After Hours, the voice referendum and the arts. So a big welcome. Um, I want to begin the evening by inviting you to ground yourself in the deep knowledge that long before the Victorian College of the Arts was considered or the University of Melbourne was, was thought of, that for generations the Bunwurrung and Wurundjeri people of the East Kulin Nation practiced song and dance on this land, they made paintings, sculptures, they practiced healing, they shared stories. And these traditions and rituals continue today. And please join me with great honor and joy in acknowledging their elders past, present, and those yet to come. Um, we have a very special evening tonight and um, I just thought I'd do a little bit of housekeeping and let you know how the evening's going to proceed. Firstly, thank you for your patience while we sorted out some technical difficulties. We really appreciate that. Secondly, the way the evening's going to work, we... Um, well, let me just tell you what the evening's not. The evening's not a debate. The evening unfolds as a conversation. It unfolds as a conversation about the power of art and, um, and the referendum that happens in, in a few days. And really, that's what this conversation is about. It's about giving voice to artists. And it's not like the artists who are speaking represent all artists. But given the inseparability of art from life, the voice of artists in the conversation around, uh, around the referendum is critical. And so we get to hear from three extraordinary artists um, and we also get to hear from a constitutional expert. You will actually get to hear from me. Just so you know, I'm going to be bobbing up and down throughout the night. So just be prepared for that because my job is really to create a space for this conversation for our artists to step into. My job is really to create a, an extraordinary space where our speakers get to share what matters to them about the arts and the referendum. So um, before we get to the speakers, we have a couple of very um, special parts of the evening. In a moment, I'm going to um, invite John Wayne Parsons to the stage. Um, he will tell us about the, the song that he's chosen to sing. And, um, and then following that, um, we've invited Nicholas Curry, um, an, a, another extraordinary visual artist, a very recent graduate of the Victorian College of the Arts, to, um, to share the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And then I'll introduce the speakers. Each of those speakers... Um, will speak individually. Uh, by the way, one of the speakers is unwell and won't be able to join us. This is Dr Janelle Evans. She's written a statement and she's asked me, uh, she's given me the privilege of reading her statement. So you get me and not Janelle. Um, and after those three presentations, well actually four presentations because Mark will be first, then three artists. We'll invite the two artists and Mark will be here on the monitor and we'll open to questions from the floor. Um, so that's, and then we finish with another special performance by John Wayne Parsons. So um, please join me in, in welcoming John to the stage and a big welcome to yourselves. Thank you, Brother David. Uh, very lovely 
opportunity to come and share and open in song. I think um, it's so important because there's a lot of big discussions that's going on at the moment. Some of us are still deciding, is it yes, is it no, you know, all that type of stuff. It is complex and we'll hear from our artists today. But um, before I sing this song, I just want to acknowledge country and our brother did a beautiful acknowledgement of country. I'm not from this area. I'm an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander man from Queensland. On my grandmother's side, Yagara country. She grew up on a little mission called Perga Mission just outside of Ipswich. She was born under a tree there. And I just love every time I think of her, the experiences she's been through, but the resilience that she passed on to our family. Then on the Torres Strait Islander side, I'm proud through my mother's line from the Kemer Kemer Miriam Nations, the Eastern Islands of the Torres Straits. And I want to share a song from the Torres Straits. There'll be two songs from the Torres Straits today. But it's so important to acknowledge country and our brother, like I said, did a beautiful welcome. And I would also like to extend that acknowledgement. We've heard of the word womanjeka or womanjika. I spoke to Annie Caroline many times and before I could sing my song, even just speaking that one word, I just feel like let's acknowledge country here first and then I can go on and sing some of my language songs and stories. So Waminjika, can everyone say that? Waminjika. Yes, and there's Womanjeka. <laughs> so there's a couple of different pronunciations, but it's not just about welcome, it's about coming with purpose. And so before I start, the song I'd like to sing is called Baboya Nunumaygi Mari. And I've got my beautiful sister that will come up if she would like to. This is impromptu. <laughs> so bear with us. <laughs> Going to do a bit of a cappella. We won't try and hurt your ears. <laughs> but it is a blessing song. It is a hymn from the Torres Straits. And everything that we open up, a lot of the mob up there, strong in religion, but strong in culture as well. So it's about settling our spirits and acknowledging what we're here for today. Baba wa yanu no mai gimari. Do something then a little bit stronger the second time. Baba wa yanu mai gimari. Baba wa Baba we are in my gimari. Baba we are in my gimari. Baba we are in my gimari. Blessings on you all, and thank you to my sister. <laughs> Thank you.
This is flash. Ah, uh, Jingari, my name is Nicholas Curry. I am a descendant of the Mullanjali clan of the Yuguma Bear people from Queensland. Aguri here, as I just would like to say thank you to Uncle and thank you to Sister and Auntie to, for singing. Very much appreciated. Um, today I'll be reading the Uluru state from, Statement from the Heart as it was written. Thank you. We gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention coming from all points of the southern sky make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nation of Australia's continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our, our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation according to the common law from time immoral and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereign tree is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between the land or mother nature and the Aboriginal and Tor Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basic basis of our ownership of the soil or better of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished and coexists with the sovereignty of the crown. How could this be otherwise? That people possess a land for 60 millennia and this sacred link disappears from world history in merely the last 200 years. With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionately, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are alien from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in descent. Uh, and our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be the hope for our future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined into the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth-telling about our history. In 1967, we were counted. In 2017, we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. Thank you. Thanks so much, John, Rachel, Nick. Um, there was one thing I forgot to let you know about, and you've probably found them already. On, on everybody's seat is a kind of order of speakers, and um, it'll tell you um, it'll tell you who all of our speakers are, and a little just a little statement about their backgrounds. You're all grown ups; you know how to Google, so you can you can do that later. Um, but our first speaker is Dr. Mark McMillan, and he 
has pre-recorded his statement. He will join us. He's in um, Austin, Texas at the moment, and he will join us for the questions later on. But we are ready for, for Mark's presentation. Thanks. Sure. Uh, it's nice to see you, Ash. My name's Mark McMillan. I'm a Wiradjuri Gabir from a little place called Trangi in the central west of New South Wales. It's about 75 k's uh, west of Dubbo. And I'm um, over here in Austin, Texas, uh, and wishing I could be there. But uh, fortunately, Uncle Charlie's Taste of Country, which is my business honouring our family, um, has uh, we've received an order over here in the US. So I'm over here on delivering on that, uh, but it's really great to be with you. Thank you, Ash. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, referendum are our way of changing the constitution, and so the one of the principles of our federal government is that. We can only change the Constitution and the words of the Constitution and the spirit of the Constitution in certain ways. So Section 128 of the Commonwealth of Australia Act sets out the mechanisms of which a constitutional referenda can be put to the people. And it's more than a question. So everybody gets confused between, well, what's the difference between a referendum or a plebiscite or a question? And a referendum specifically amends the constitution. So since federation in 200, in 2000, oh, sorry, 1901, there's been 30, uh, 44 referendum put to the people and only eight of them have been successful. So you can tell that amending the constitution and not, you know, putting it to the people uh, is a perilous thing to do because there's it's a double hurdle. You have to have a majority of people, in other words, the majority of registered voters, um, and don't forget Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples were excluded from this, from Federation until 1962, and that you then need a majority of the states, not the territories. So in Australia, there's only six states. So when it comes to this national idea, there is no Northern Territory and there is no Australian Capital Territory and, indeed, there is no Commonwealth for the purposes of constitutional amendment. So it comes down to, of the six states, you must have four. So when people start to talk about, well, why, why are we talking about, oh, it'll probably be okay in, in New South Wales and Victoria but it's a looking a bit precarious in Queensland and WA, if you do anything past having two, uh, and traditionally Queensland and Western Australia have been pretty much adverse to any vote, um, a positive change to the Commonwealth. Uh, so, you know, you're really left with only one state left to play with because, you know, if you don't carry four states, even though the weird part is majority of people in in Australia, live in New South Wales and Victoria. Mm. So yeah. you've got this weird sort of weird little thing that goes, um, well, it's really not just about uh, the people, it's also about the states because without the states there would be no Commonwealth. So when people say, well, let's just get rid of the states, we don't need three levels of government, you just can't because the states allow the Commonwealth to exist. That's the point of the Constitution. Um, well, ironically, um, we've done some weird things to the Constitution. So you can have for the purposes of the Constitution, there's two senators from the ACT and two senators from the Northern Territory. So they've got representation, but that's a different issue than the provisions of Section 128, which is how do you change the Constitution? So it's a, it's a little bit awkward. Um, and you're right, absolutely right. There are more people living in the ACT than in Tasmania, yet Tasmania, because it's a state, has 12 senators, whereas the ACT only has two. But, so you've got all of these anomalies 
but what in this way, what we're really talking about is amending the constitution. So it, it's not all of the pre preceding sections on representation. You're specifically looking at constitutional alteration. So you can only look at section 128. It's there to advise the parliament, not the executive. So it's not there to advise just um, the, the government. It's there to advise parliament. And so when you actually take it as a whole, it's not a substitute for our own internal representation mechanisms of which our sovereign nations depend on it. So... You know, it's not there to represent Wiradjuri Nation or Yorta Yorta or Mayor people of, you know, Miriam Island and all of that sort of stuff. It's not there to do exactly that. Sorry, that is my... So I think this is a really wonderful opportunity for us to be really clear that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people didn't exist before 1788. We had sovereign peoples that have existed for 80,000 years. So we've got to get really, this is our way of practising our own sovereignty um, rather than practising a form of recognition that we want others to recognise us. So it is two things going on at once. And I think as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations, not Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, mm. we have the ability then to actually say, well, for the purposes of the voice, this is advising a representative body on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander issues. Mm. Then when it comes back to our own political and cultural governance, that's got absolutely nothing to do with white people or non-Indigenous people. So we are getting more mature and more skilled about saying those two things exist at the same time. Mm. And it's up to us to articulate and amongst ourselves the best way that we speak to that amongst ourselves. So, you know, we've got to be really clear this is a great opportunity for us to actually start to form into our sovereign groups Mm. And then how does that then inform this idea of a representative structure that is simply there to advise the parliament on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander issues, not yeah. about Torres Strait, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander sovereign peoples? Well, again, I think there's this... Um, well, it can be all of those things. So whether what is it is that is ceding. So sovereign nations cede sovereignty every day by entering into its sovereign relations with other sovereigns. So this idea that somehow it's a cession of our sovereignty for the purpose of the colonial project, I don't think is really true. I think what we do is, you know, the more that we speak across our own sovereign borders between like Wemba Wemba or Yorta Yorta and Wiradjuri and, um, uh, you know, any other nations that speak across borders are literally engaging in sovereignty and the session. So it's not giving away those rights. It's actually saying how do we use those rights in a more confined but negotiated space. So people who are saying, oh, it's a our sovereignty will be ceded. It's like it's not because one of the ways that you actually don't cede sovereignty is actually saying we're not ceding our sovereignty. We're engaging with a sovereign practice. So those the alarmists that are going, oh, this is all about session in its absolutist terms, are really not thinking that for 80,000 years we've always been engaged in sovereign activities, engagement across borders, establishment of new borders, establishment of areas of jurisdiction where all the territory might be needed for different cultural things, for different cultural groups. So those that are more, and they've got a right, that is their right to explain their view on this is a session issue, you go, that is a view, but there's also a hundred other views out there that might not be that same thing. And I think that's really an exciting proposition in a modern democracy that our first peoples have got a range of views that talk to the very issue of sovereignty. 
and whether this is an activity of cession of that sovereignty or cess or giving over some rights to exist in an absolute term, or you've got the, um, um, you know, a, a million and other ways of articulating the same point, but they're all valid. They're all an exercise of our own sovereignty that has never been ceded. So I think that that discussion about it's either this or that is misplaced, um, but it's still really important that however it's positioned, it's positioned with an activity of sovereignty in mind. So we are all doing it for the same reasons. We're just saying different things, but they're all the same activity. Yeah, and let's base it, but let's bring it back to, so the parliament is a representative structure. So mob on the ground will always go to their House of Rep members and their senators for representation on their behalf. That is what the whole constitution is designed to do. When it comes to the voice, it is advising the parliament on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander issues. So it's not that it's not a direct representative model of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander thing. It's not part of that democratic process. So it's both. Um, so you, you go anybody, any representative body, whether it's a land council, whether it's a community-based organization, community-controlled organization, or just a black fella who has a right to be represented because they're voted. They've got a right to be represented by their member and their senator. So you go, it's all the same. All this voice is doing, and in fact, it could enhance our ongoing articulation of a newly formed right. So don't forget at the Federation, there were no human rights. Human rights were a construct of the world coming out of the Second World War, thinking we do not ever want to treat human beings the way that human beings were treated during the Second World War. So the United Nations, uh, you know, as a, as a move along from the, the, the League of Nations, which failed because Second World War erupted, you've got all of these kind of things where you go, right, so let's think about these as a continuum. So rights evolution is equally as important as the articulation of those rights in evolution. So we've now got the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People that 30 years ago didn't exist, 60 years ago wasn't even thought about because it wasn't a human right. So if we put that into its context, we're now in this place of where we can articulate, articulate the human rights that are specifically directed to us, um, to overcome the attempted eradication and genocide of us. So, you know, let's not pussyfoot around. This is also about white people trying to overcome shit they created. So you've also got this then who better than blackfellas to articulate our needs, aspirations and desires in a rights language and discourse. I think what's really unique about the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is it's not a human right. It's a right on a governance structure to exist. So you move it from a rights agenda to a governing agenda, and sovereignty is a governing issue. Rights are, I've got the right to health and all of that sort of stuff, whereas this is actually attending to our right to exist as a polity, as a sovereign entity and entities, because there isn't just one homogenous blob of us. Um, and so... But that's come on the back of a lot of black fellas, um, particularly Professor Megan Davis and others, Larissa Barrett, Nicole Watson, you know, to name a few who've been working in the space of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander rights are both human rights and their governance rights. So that's what we're getting more mature at, at explaining to our own mob. So as we start to articulate those rights, we're getting more clear and more specific about how we want our rights enforced, in other words, st to stop other people doing shit to us, or how do we want our rights exercised, and that, that's create the space so which can, we can fulfil those. So, you know, there's been lots of work over decades by blackfellas, and, you know, you go back to the political movements um, out of Victoria and you go, that was world-leading 
um, advocacy and activism in political activism, um, Sir Doug Nichols, you know, all of the, uh, yeah. So we've got a history of uh, warriorness in the evolution of, of particular social movements as they come up. This is just one of those wonderful moments that uh, it's not left to the shoulders of the giants. It's actually spread evenly because pretty much every black fellow in Australia is so used to now articulating our existences as individuals, as family, as clan, as kin, as nation in a rights discourse. So what I what I would really like to say to the audience is if you're a black fella, how do we want, how do you think your sovereignty will be exercised in how you vote? So don't think of it as what people will do to you. Think of it as, as a sovereign activity that you're not ceding, but you're going, you're making your decision not as a recipient of benevolence of whiteness, but as a sovereign entity. Um, to the non-Indigenous people, I would urge you to think, how will this make you feel as a non-Indigenous person if this goes south? Because this is really a judgment on your lot not on us. So, you know, there's lots of ways to think about it and and it shouldn't matter what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander think. How are you going to create an environment if which you want your sovereigns to act in a particular way that is in relation to us, not the other way around? Because we're not here to beg you to recognise our sovereignty. We don't need you to recognise it because it just is. But how is it going to make you feel as a non-Indigenous Australian in a moment in time? Um, Mark is with us in Austin, Texas, so he can hear us. Thank you so much, Mark, and thank you for... Um, a, uh, you'll, you'll meet him later on in the evening, but a big thank you to... Um, my colleague Ash Perry for um, interviewing Mark and editing that interview and bringing that presentation to us which with such incredible integrity and sensitivity. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, Ash. Uh, yes, please. Um, I don't really know how to introduce this next part, except I, I certainly you know, when I woke up this morning, I certainly didn't plan to be uh, the person reading um, Janelle Evans' statement. You know, I spoke to her briefly in between her coughs, and she's so disappointed that she's not here. And as I was preparing the evening and I was thinking about, well, you know, hello, look at me, I'm not Janelle. And... Um, And I, look, if you would just bear with me and just try something out with me, it, it would make a difference, I think, to Janelle and myself. So I'm going to read Janelle's statement, and my request is that you close your eyes and you don't see me. And if you know Janelle, you know what Janelle looks like, but perhaps by closing your eyes, you're present to Janelle's voice. You know, you'll hear my voice, but Janelle's... The, the power of Janelle's voice. So uh, please, if you'd like to take me up on that invitation, I would love that. Okay. So this is a statement from Dr. Janelle Evans, uh, artist, writer, academic, here at the Victorian College of the Arts. Good evening. I'm sorry I could not be present for this evening's art forum as I have caught a virus. My talk for this evening will now be read to you. I would first like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging of the Boonwurrung and Wurundjeri peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose unceded lands this art forum is taking place. I would like to acknowledge all Elders who are present as well as all First Nations people who are gathered here this evening as a descendant of the Darug people of Western Sydney, I pay my respects to my elders past and present. 
I would also like to acknowledge my Daraga ancestors, as well as my Anglo-Celtic and European ancestors who settled in this country. My extended family is made up of many peoples from many different cultures, including many First Peoples from across this country. I have extended kinship ties to Arente, Wiradjuri, Bunjalung, Kwandamukka and other language groups. I also have kinship ties to Thai, German, Swedish, French, Irish, Scots, Welsh, English, Chinese, Indian, Pacific Islander and several other national cultures. Our extended family is truly a reflection of contemporary Australia. In Australian Aboriginal culture, no one is a stranger. We find commonalities and kinship ties to create personal and family connections. If someone we meet has no connection to our family, friends or wider acquaintances, we incorporate that person into one of our moieties or skin kinship groups to create a sense of belonging. In this way as well, Animals, birds, fish, trees, rocks, waterways and the very country we live on becomes part of our family and we have enduring responsibilities for them both culturally and socially. For tens of thousands of years, First Peoples have inhabited this continent. Millennia before the last ice age of 25 to 16,000 years ago. Our ancestors were already here, bearing witness to the changing climate and the impact on geographies of land, rivers and seas. They bore witness to cosmological and astronomical events and created oral histories and songs to record their eyewitness accounts. In ceremony, as well as with the passing on of knowledge, our ancestors sang, told stories, kicked up dust, carved geometries in the landscape and painted representations of these histories on their bodies, in caves and on shields, as a record of their own lives and of their ancestral connections. When the colonisers came to this land, they saw what, what to their eyes was a brutal race of no naked savages, uncivilised beings without a culture. And so the way was prepared for the subjugation and eradication of First Peoples. Through disease, the bullet, poisoning of waterholes, strychnine laced bread and meat, and other atrocities, hundreds of thousands of First Peoples died by the hands of the colonisers. For those of our ancestors who survived, many were placed on missions and reserved to ease the final days of what white Australia thought was a dying race. From the time of Federation, the Australian government enacted an assimilationist policy to ensure that this country had a uniform white dominant culture. Because of the white Australia policy, Aboriginal people were not included in the first constitution of this country. In 1971, when the senior men at the Papunya settlement in Central Australia began painting their traditional stories on boards, doors and walls, the Papunya Tula art movement was born. Despite some misgivings about the stories being painted for uninitiated white eyes, the men said they wanted the world to know that Aboriginal people had a culture, that we are a cultured people. The men found ways to hide the sacred elements behind a screen of dots and thus a new style of painting emerged, which 52 years later is still captivating the international art market. A fire was lit by the Papunya Tula artists and a billion dollar industry was created. An industry that Camilla Roy artist Richard Bell claims is controlled and managed for white profit with little of the proceeds from sales going to Aboriginal artists. The tourism industry has seen a plethora of fake Aboriginal art said to be about 80% of the total market. These fake objects are often made in sweatshops in Southeast Asia and Africa 
or by backpackers during their stay in Australia. Along with many First Nations artists, the Honourable Bob Catter MP, Member of the House of Representatives, has raised this issue in Parliament, but to date, little and sustained little direct and sustained action has been taken to stamp out this burgeoning industry. Tax loopholes exist that allow gallery owners and collectors to pay Aboriginal artists with goods rather than cash. During the 1990s and early 2000s, many Aboriginal artists in the central and western deserts were paid with Toyota Hilux vehicles instead of cash for the sale of their artworks. This allowed collectors to write off the vehicles on their annual tax returns. No forethought was given to the cost of vehicle registration, insurance costs, fuel or maintenance which resulted in many of these vehicles being abandoned due to lack of cash to continue operating them. Australian taxpayers may not also be aware that millions of dollars of taxpayers' funds are paid to overseas entities to provide art and other workshops to Aboriginal people in remote communities. These entities also employ backpackers and other casual workers to go into remote communities for a week at a time to teach children how to tell a story or how to paint a picture or how to play a tune on a guitar. The communities see an endless round of fly-in, fly-out itinerant workers who make no real connections nor do they build ongoing relationships. There is no attempt to create a meaningful educational outcome through the provision of VET certificates nor employment outcomes for Aboriginal peoples. Taxpayer funds are siphoned off overseas when they would be better spent providing real jobs for Aboriginal people. I personally raised this issue with the appropriate government department 10 years ago but to date have not received a response. No doubt this is because of successive changes of government during the intervening years. Or could it be possible, the cynic in me is operating at full strength here, that there is no incentive to take these million dollar grants out of white hands in order to provide Aboriginal people with self-determination and agency. In cities, towns and settlements across the nation, Aboriginal artists are at the vanguard of creating change and agency for many of our peoples by reinvigorating our stories, our languages, our culture. However, we can't do this alone. In the language of my Darug community, I would like to introduce you to the expression Garabarala, come sit down with us. Let us share our knowledge. Let us listen to each other. Let us feast together. Hear our voice and let us walk together to create real and lasting change so, could, so that we can build a better Australia together. Also in my language, Dijarigura, thank you. I know that Janelle is tuned in to Zoom. I should, I forgot to welcome people in Zoom land. If you're in Zoom land and you've joined us, I think there are a couple of hundred people who've joined us from across the country in Zoom land, a big hearty welcome to you. And um, especially to you, Janelle, thank you for the privilege of um, reading your words. I hope I did them justice. Um, please join me in welcoming our next speaker, the exquisite Aretha Brown. Thank you so much. Uh, hello everyone, how's it going? Good day. Um, <laughs> hi, my name is Aretha. Uh, I'll just come up the front because I got a lapel mic, but thank you all so much for coming. Thanks to Ani and Uncle for the uh, brilliant song before. Uh, I think I speak for everyone when I say that was awesome. And yeah, I'm a little bit nervous, um, so just bear with me. Uh, I just got off a flight yesterday uh, from Darwin. I've just come from uh, East Timor with my our collective. We were doing some murals up there up in Dili, so I'm a little bit kind of uh, 
Yeah, I mean, physically I'm here, spiritually I'm still in the beach in Dili, but um, <laughs> just bear with me. So yeah, I think I'll start. Uh, there's me, oh my God, such an embarrassing photo. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, um, yeah, that's me. Uh, uh, sorry, I don't even know where to begin. My notes are all just like uh, actual drawings. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think mean, I kind of, I, I'll, mm, okay. So my name's Aretha, I'm a proud Gabangri woman. Um, I was born and bred uh, in the Melbourne's western suburbs, but um, I'm mob uh, from northern New South Wales, Gabangri. And yeah, I think I just wanted to kind of speak a little bit about why I'm voting yes and why it's important for me um, as a young artist. So yeah, I've got my own art collective called Kiss My Art. I think there's a slide at some point if we just want to flick over. Oh, here we go. Um, yeah, which is like made up of predominantly um, young indigenous crew, um, mostly women or non-binary folk and I just love to paint walls. There's not really much else to say. I just love to do it. Um, and I think it's really important for me just because um, I always like to remember my grandfather. I got another photo as well. Uncle Roger Brown. This is where I always get a little bit emotional because my pop, um, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> I was very close with my pop and he passed away recently. Um, oh shit, sorry. And um, yeah, he was like a very important person to me. and. Um, the thing, I, the thing about my pop though is he, uh, God bless him, like this, one of the smartest people I've ever met, like real Bushman type, like just amazing knowledge systems, but ultimately like you wouldn't ever catch him going to a place like the NGV or Gertrude Contemporary or, <laughs> and like that's not me being shady, I swear to God, I just mean that like he just wouldn't go to those places just because they weren't welcoming, you know, and it's, it's hard enough for me as an artist to want to like to like feel comfortable in those spaces, let alone being you know a fella that was an opal miner from from Lightning Ridge. <laughs> so um, he just yeah he just wouldn't kind of you know it was always really difficult for me because I wanted to be an artist, I wanted to, in my family to kind of come together, but just what those spaces weren't for him. So I was like, well, how am I going to get around this? And so ultimately, I realised that making murals and doing street art was my way around this, you know, because then it means that all mob could come along. There was no curator telling me I could or couldn't do something. Um, and ultimately, yeah, the, the mural, and I swear this is in a flex, but we've just finished our 65th mural up in uh, Dili, which is insane. Yeah. Um, 65, and so I'm 22, so I'm pretty young, but um, I think like the point is that um, I couldn't have done that many works if I was going through gallery systems and through institutions especially. Um, I could only do it as a street artist because again, I, I never, I think it's me being a little bit like, you know, like I don't want anyone to tell me what to do, but I also like, you know, I believe in my work and I believe that um, it's my land and like this is how I decolonize is by literally taking up space physically. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of that. <laughs> you might, maybe we go back to that other mural. Ah, uh, sorry, the first photo. <laughs> I, it, when I sent it, it felt fine, but now seeing it on a big screen, I'm like, oh. It's a little bit embarrassing, but yes, this is a big work. Um, I just did this one in Canada. Um, I was there with my good friend Tyler, who's actually filming tonight, and I was there with uh, actually the band Admiral and the Sniffers. You guys might know them. They're like awesome young band. Uh, Amy's a very good friend of mine, and they invited me over because I was doing a mural in New York. And they're like, do you want to come on tour? And I was like, say less, I'm there. And then as we were kind of there, we got talking, and they're like, you know, me and Amy were like, shit, we should, uh, we should do something while we're, while we're here in Canada, because I think, um, you know, a lot of Canadian people have a very similar history to kind of indigenous mob here. And so uh, we really just wanted to kind of make a big statement. So this is kind of one of my most recent works that I did about, um, how long ago now, like about two months ago, um, which is, yeah, Australia has a black future treaty now. Um, and I think, um, yeah, so that was kind of our big last one. And now that's, they've kind of toured with that internationally, which is like a pretty big deal for me, I guess, because now it's the first time like my mural is like toured, because otherwise, you know, they're kind of stuck in one spot. Um, <laughs> so you can't like take them anywhere. You can't even really have an opening night as well, which kind of sucks, because you're just in the street and you just look a bit weird, loitering. Um, but yes, it toured all around and they've taken it to Europe and London and London, AKA Skull Island, uh, that's what I like to call it. Um, but, Kong Island, yeah, um, it's fine, but yeah, it's kind of gone all around. I think, I know, I'm very uh, badly making the point of just like, um, yeah, that's why I make murals, it's ultimately for my nan. I think there's a photo of my nan as well, do you want to just chop that up? Yeah, there she is. Um, slay, go off. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, amazing, you can see that there's lots of divas in the family. Um, Anyway, but yeah, she also recently passed away, only like about a, a week or two after my pop, which is like the most adorable thing I've ever heard. But um, yeah, again, like she, you know, 
she, her and my pop just, they probably just wouldn't go into those spaces, you know? Um, and I never wanted my art to be elitist. I never wanted to lose touch from other young people, especially, or other young mob, especially anyone. So that's why I like doing public art. And um, yeah, I think, hang on, I got my little, <laughs> my little gammon notes here. Um, yeah, I think my other point was that uh, as a young person that I currently actually at still v at, at VCA. It's taking it's gonna take me five years to do my three course my three year course because I kind of just keep um, just a bit slack. I'm sorry, um, <laughs> bit busy, a little bit busy, but I haven't actually passed yet. So everyone, I know it's not bad. Anyway, but um, yeah, so just I think for me, I make the joke all the time, and you know, if we're gonna talk treaty and yes, right, we're gonna do truth telling. Then you know, I'm gonna you know be a little bit shady about VCA just for one second. I'm just gonna say that you know when I was in uh, VCA, so only last year, like there was only, there was, a, there was virtually no other Indigenous students in my year level, which is like insane. I always make the joke that like, <laughs> at one point in last year, I had more white professors called Chris than I did other Aboriginal kids in my year level. <laughs> insane, <laughs> insane. Three Chris's taught me, three Chris's. Other Aboriginal kids, two. I don't, uh, come on, do the math. Anyway, insane. But it's like, I think for me, I was in high school and it's, it's not like I ever got like, um, you know, someone careers day coming and being like, oh, you know, do you want to become a bedazzler? You know, like, um, it was never an option like science or STEM was. So I was like, you know, it just wasn't, it, that, you know, any artist can tell you that like, <laughs> it's true. They were like, who wants to make hats? You know, bleach hats um, as a career option. Um, so I kind of had to form that for myself, but ultimately I realized that, you know, being an artist is a real job. We all know that. Uh, it's just as tiring as any other job, even though it's really fun and awesome. But um, I think for me, it's understanding that we need to get more Aboriginal kids in our art institutions because Indigenous um, history, you know, it's, it is an oral history and it's, it is also our history is taught through art, like Uncle even like singing tonight, you know, um, and Aunty as well with like theatre and everything. It's, it's, it's like a, um, in my opinion anyway, it's, it's a very, we're, we're artists, we're an artistic people and um, to not have other Aboriginal students in my year level is insane. You know, um, and so for me, I, I so many times I've gone to my white lecturers, being like, "Why are there no other Aboriginal kids in my year level?" Like, it, it's never because there's like lack of Aboriginal students or, or Aboriginal people that want to become artists. It's never that. It's about there being no pathways and uh, no kind of clear kind of um, yeah, no, no one kind of believing that it's a, it's a serious career, I guess. Um, so I think I <laughs> I wish I had the answer to how to, how we get more Aboriginal kids into art schools, uh, but I think for me it's like kind of the step taking, going from high school into art school and making that be more of a clearer platform, I think. Yeah. Uh, and so I think for me, um, that's something that I like to think about because they, I, never <laughs> I never had that person. Um, yeah, so I think that's um, one little point. Um, and then just secondly, yeah, even high school, I guess, just to touch, touch on that again. I had a pretty, you know, pretty rough time being a uh, like young queer, especially indigenous kid, I uh, remember. It was like year 12, um, and it got to my, it was like muck up day in year 12. And everyone, you know, it was like muck up day, it's like everyone comes dressed as like, you know, funny little outfits. And there was like a kind of like a party thing at our school because, you know, uh, exams were just about to start. It's like the final day. And I remember <coughs> I rocked up that day and I went to a school in like Footscray, oh, sorry, uh, Williamstown, which is like Melbourne's western suburb. So inner city public school is my point. And I remember we rocked up that day and there was this kid from my school that like, dressed up as, um, <laughs> this is gonna sound insane, dressed up as like a Nazi, um, as like their funny costume. And I remember being like, okay, uh, mm, mm, I don't know about that, um, insane. And so not only did the student actually not got, like she, she didn't get sent home that day, she just had to take off her like uh, swastikas and stuff, <laughs> um, amazing. Um, and she didn't get sent home, but I remember that afternoon I walked back into my art class and my art teacher, her name is Miss Freya, and she's like, uh, she actually went to VCA, which is really sweet. She's a, she's a legend. Um, she was like, Aretha, listen, I need to talk to you for a second. And I was like, oh, what's up? What's up? And she sat me down. She's like, listen, uh, you know, the student that kind of dressed up today um, in that outfit, she actually, um, her and her mates broke into like the art uh, room the night before um, and have actually damaged all the paintings that I was doing for my assessment, which is insane. Yeah, <laughs> really sad. And I promise I don't say that as like a woe is me. Like I don't want sympathy or anything. I think it was just this moment of like, oh my God, like it's year 12. It's hard enough just trying to get through high school being white, <laughs> being indigenous and trying to get through high school is insane. And so not only did I have to deal with like, essentially what was a hate crime um, in my final 
days before I had to do my like my literature exams and my you know maths exams and stuff um, I had to kind of the onus again was on me to kind of have to deal with that um, and deal with the aftermaths of that and um, yeah I think ultimately the, I got to the position where I was like how did this happen in the first place you know how do we kind of make these environments where um, where people can feel comfortable to do this kind of thing um, and yeah that ultimately led me to uh, becoming the youngest indigenous youth Prime Minister, I hate to use the title, but it is what it is. Um, and so I think it's kind of hard as well. I, it's something that I'm kind of grappling with, being such a staunch vote yes person, while also kind of working, uh, you know, as a youth kind of Prime Minister in Canberra for a while, um, going back and forth between here and Melbourne, working in Parliament and stuff. Um, because how does that kind of work as a sovereign person? You know, I've, I've got my own <laughs> thing going on. I don't really want to recognise the government, but we also ultimately have to work with it. Um, how do we go about that and how do we kind of uh, understand that cognitive distance that it brings up for everyone and so you know it's a big question and I don't have an answer unfortunately but it is something we will have to kind of collectively work through because I think most of us would be like okay the government sucks but we you know what's the alternative but we want vote yes you know but we also don't want to be like best friends with just enterprise so what is our options <laughs> what are we going to do here um, so yeah it's, it's, it's you know and I think my advice is kind of it's okay to kind of sit in that uncomfortable space for a little bit um, because yeah I don't have the answers and um, I think yeah it, it's, it's kind of okay to kind of disagree with the government uh, you, you know th th there can be two rights at the same time um, you cannot like the Australian government obviously and also want to vote yes and not understand uh, and, and understand the kind of um, how that kind of works I guess Th that's how I'm dealing with it anyway um, and yeah, and last, last point, I promise I won't ramble, but just, um, I think, I, I wrote a statement um, when I did the work in Canada, but it was just kind of talking about how, for me, I know this is like a really hot, it's like a spicy take, but like that, you know, the, the, the voice referendum for me isn't really about race. If anything, for me, it's actually a class struggle. Um, I think at the end of the day, like, you know, I ultimately want a socialist democratic government um, and, for me, it's, I don't want to like black and white people like pitted against each other because ultimately, the real enemies here is the you know the wealthy elite that kind of do the bidding for uh, our, po our, our politicians in this country. Um, they're the, they're the enemy. Um, I could I would happily say that out loud many times. Um, it's not white versus black. It's actually regular working class Australians like ourselves. Uh, yeah, and these wealthy elite that are ultimately destroying our land through corporate corporate greed and uh, you know. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a class struggle, which I think is a kind of another way to kind of uh, consider it as well. Um, because, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't want it to become um, as binary as black and white because it's not that simple. Um, and I ultimately, yeah, see it as a class struggle. So I think that's something that I try to kind of think about in my art as well. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's <laughs> kind of my point. Um, I hope this made sense and I hope that this kind of shows you more than anything that uh, for me anyway, Indigenous Mob are very visual learners, I can't, I'm not a very good writer, I literally had to draw, I had to draw these points uh, to understand them, so please we need more Mob in art schools. Uh, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to do it. Um, yeah, okay. Oh, uh, we'll see. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, and I think, last point as well, is just like, I want to thank all the, um, you know, I want to acknowledge everyone that came tonight, but especially all the young people that turned up. Uh, it's awesome to be, you know, 22 and standing up on this platform at, at Melbourne University, which is insane. And ultimately, like, young people are going to be the driving force behind uh, the change that's going to affect our future. So I don't, you know, I love my elders. My elders are the most important people in my life. They are Elvis, they are Beyonce, they are my everythings. <laughs> but ultimately, we have to learn from them, but also understand that, you know, we can decide to take uh, what knowledge we need as well and also kind of, uh, consider our own knowledge systems as well because we're really smart as well and, and we're allowed to kind of say that and um, take ourselves seriously as young people as well um, because I don't know I just kind of think we're really cool like, <laughs> I just think we're it and I think we're gonna ultimately make the change uh, that we're gonna see out here um, and you know everyone everyone says you know wait till these like old dinosaurs die in parliament and like wait till they die out and stuff I'm not saying that I'm just saying people are saying that <laughs> I'm not saying let's wait, let's just wait around, clock's ticking, no, uh, but you know those, I know it sounds crazy, but like those kind of old politicians that, you know, again, do this kind of 
wealthy bidding for the elite, have children. <laughs> and I'm sure we've all kind of met kind of uh, people who are kind of more right-leaning young people. And so I think we have to understand that we have, uh, well, maybe, uh, you know, if you're non-Indigenous, you kind of do have a responsibility to actually kind of do some convincing yourself um, on a really personal level. Um, because it, it can't rely on uh, black followers all the time. Uh, just speaking to all the mob here tonight, everyone's just exhausted. Um, <laughs> like I, I, I'm, I'm so tired and it's to be indigenous and kind of constantly work in these institutions, um, it's exhausting. And I'm 22, like I couldn't imagine how elders do it or um, some of the followers here tonight, it's like commendable. And, um, but it ultimately it's, it's exhausting. And um, you know, I'm about to kind of quit painting for a little bit just because I, <laughs> I need a big break. I can't uh, work in these institutions um, in the way that I'm kind of doing it right now. I need to step back and kind of work out how we can all kind of, uh, you know, be healthier. And I think, again, my final takeaway is just like, you know, at the end of the day, we're all activists. I wanna, I, I'd like to assume we're all activists in this room. Um, if you're here tonight, you're an activist. <laughs> and ultimately, you're gonna be saying the exact same thing your whole life. You know, you're gonna be saying the same stories, um, arguing the same points. Every point that I'm making tonight, my nan said a thousand times over, you know, I'm not reinventing the wheel here. Um, Mob have been saying the same stuff, you know, land rights, sovereignty now, always will be, you know, they're famous slogans for a reason. But um, if you're saying the same thing over and over, you've got to work out how it's sustainable for you. Uh, and for me, that's through art. So we're going to make sure that, you know, our art is our therapy and we're going to get more Mob in art schools. And that's my, that's it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh my goodness, thank you, Aretha. Um, please welcome to the stage, Rachel Mazza AM. Well, my notes are just as bad. <laughs> I like not having to stand behind that thing, so I think I'll follow your, your great example. Um, thanks, Wayne, for the beautiful song. Also acknowledging the country that we're on, the lands of the... Um, hey, where are we? There, the Wurundjeri. No, Bunrung. Wurundjeri? Bunrung, Wurundjeri. Yeah, we're at the kind of intersection, eh, between these two mobs. But also acknowledging um, uh, one of the impacts, because there are impacts, of colonisation is exactly that. The, 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 the knowledge about where those boundaries were that have been concreted over... Uh, layers and layers and layers of concrete have have created these these and and it's in all our uh, all our city centres. Oh, I just heard the microphone. Sorry, you probably want me to be on that microphone. Bad luck. Yeah, good. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, the the we are living in the impacts of colonisation, and I don't mean just black fellas. All Australians are victims of the impacts of colonisation. We are all living in the impacts of colonisation. Um, and one of the, those impacts is, yeah, that, that we live on these lands, uh, that, that the Bunrung and the Wurundjeri mobs of the Kulin Nations, two of the Eastern Kulin Nations, that the two mobs that meet here right in this land we are, means that there's this contested land. And these mobs are having to navigate and fight for their right to, be, to identify as the traditional owners of this land under all this concrete and, and buildings and et cetera. And just, just acknowledging and shouting out to them the extraordinary space that they have to hold to navigate that, that right. Um, and I don't know if anyone... So, oh, anyway, Rachel Mazza is my name. Uh, my mob are from right up the top corner, uh, Torres Strait. Uh, from, I'm the Comet Clan from Murray Island or Mare, which is one of the... the in fact, is the most easterly island of the Torres Strait. It's the only one that's just on the other side of the Barrier Reef. And my grandmother, who met my grandfather on Palm Island because the Yidinji were chain-felled off their country, all that country below Cairns and, and sent to Palm Island, um, making way for whitefellas to take over. My grandfather was amongst those mobs who were kicked off um, some, th those first couple of decades after, after, after Christianity arrived. And so, so I'm, I, I'm assuming there was a wave of, okay, you fellas aren't, aren't, aren't uh, conforming, get off. So they were kicked off to Palm Island. And Palm Island being one of the many, many Aboriginal missions in this country, once again, the impacts of colon the lived 
impacts of colonisation that are actually very here present. And I guess that uh, that comment about, I mean, that statement post-colonial, there is no such thing. We are in colonial. This is, we are living the experience. The impact is here now. I'm wearing a Yes t-shirt and it took me a really very long journey to get here. I only, uh, I only jumped out of the cupboard. Hey, shut up. <laughs> Wrong cupboard, another cupboard, the other cupboard. Um, <laughs> off the fence to be able to, to, take, to take this stance of a, of a yes position. And it, like I said, it wasn't an easy journey at all. I come from such a long line, as all black fellas in this room do, a long line of staunch warriors. There isn't a moment in this country for the last 235 years that black fellas haven't been fighting and fighting for, for their land, for land back and, to have the, and, and for their sovereignty. There hasn't been a moment in this country where our, our, those that have walked before us haven't been fighting and we continue to fight. And I hear the voices of these awesome young fellas and you just inspiration in abundance. You know, the th whether, and, and, I, and you've, your, your weapon is your paintbrush, mine is theatre. And I think about the legacy, the, the journey that I grew up, the world that I grew up in um, was in fact three years before the 1960 referendum. One of those uh, yes referendums that was Phenomenal, profound, uh, one of the most successful referendums, as um, uh, this lad here was telling us, Mr. McMillan, was uh, doctor, um, was telling us uh, of those 44 referendums, there's only a handful of those have been, um, ha have been successful. So this is so massive. Now, why it's been incredibly hard for me to get to the position to, to wear, to be put on this T-shirt, um, because everything we've been fighting for is 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 being self to be able to be self determined in our, own, in our own affairs, and all of this all of this is what I like I said my we weapon of choice being theatre, but underpinning all of that is our rights to be sovereign, uh, to be self determined, to have our sovereignty as the first peoples of this land recognised, um, and what we're being presented with, and this is what, what it's been really quite a battle, and which is why there are a, 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 quite a lot of debate that's being, everyone's been hearing about within the black community. I understand that debate. I absolutely understand, well, I certainly understand one end of the spectrum. I absolutely understand those staunch warriors who are completely uncompromising in what they stand for. They have never given up on the dream of land back and sovereignty. And so the black sovereignty movement that have staunchly gone, no, we're not participating in this. And that I understand, I deeply understand, which is why it's been so, it's taken me so long to get on board. Um, the, what we are being, what the proposal is on the table is constitutional recognition. And part of that constitutional recognition, which is recognising that we are the first peoples of this country, there's no, that I'm, I'm, there's so many things that I would like to have done, I would like to have seen. I, I would like our sovereignty recognised in those, in that wording. It's not going to be, but it's, but it's, so, it's a, it's half the sense is there. We acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples were here before us. Uh, you know, I'm totally making up those words, but that 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 sense is in the in the sentence that's being proposed, and it will be uh, recognised through the establishment of this voice, uh, the establishment of a voice to Parliament, and then that that concept is going to be enshrined in the constitution, so that whoever's in government, it can't be taken away. So, in essence, that's all good. But once again. For someone who's been in the industry of working in black theatre, which is about, we are a fully, as is Ilbidgery Theatre, we are a fully self-determined, all black governed, sovereign, self-determined black organisation. Everything I have stood for in my time working in this industry has been about creating platforms for our mobs to be sovereign, self-determined in, um, in determining their narratives. 
So here's where I get back to this complexity about where we are now, is where I'm told that we're gonna set up a voice which doesn't have any teeth. I was like, how many times they were gonna keep telling me that this is a toothless thing? Like, don't be worried, it's got no teeth. I mean, obviously they're not talking to me when they're saying that, they're talking to all the, all the rest of you mob, the 97% who have the power in this, in this referendum, whose vote is gonna be what, what sways us over the line, is, is, it's that 97%. So here we have this, you know, those of us who have been down the staunch end of the spectrum going, oh, don't worry, it's, we're gonna have another advisory body who's going to give advice and do more consulting. And, you know, I have a long, as I said, working in black theatre, it was just like, oh, my Lord. I have been so now staunchly fighting for stuff your consultants and your advisory bodies. Put us in the driver's seat. So, for instance, in terms of my little theatre bubble, um, you know, we, we want to... Uh, someone comes up and we've got a, a story or a play or a film or whatever and I'm just like I don't want to hear anything else except what who are the black fellas that are driving it who are the black fellas in creative control not who have you spoken to and consulted with I am not interested in that conversation so that's where uh, this has been really difficult for me to get to this point that I now am really staunchly strongly arguing for because now I've got to the point beyond all that ah, another consultative group is actually getting to the to the principle that underlies this this incredibly point um what, uh, significant moment we are making history again country Australia because underneath this this is a principle at stake here it is and, and at the heart of this is what do you stand for as a person of this country that stands on this incredible, amazing, longest history, you live on this country, what do you stand for? As an Australian, what do you stand for? What are you prepared to do? So I get, I get that the principle at stake here is, is Australia standing tall in recognising this incredible, extraordinary history and the first peoples that are the first peoples of this land. Like that is really simple. I understand that principle uh, is, very, it's like, it's, it's the 67 referen referendum moment. Quite simply, it's, uh, yeah, um, black people should be considered citizens of this country. Like it's, it's, it's that simple. Yes, we acknowledge that, that black followers should be recognised in our, what is essentially our, uh, this kind of bit of our rule book. It's like, there's not, there's, there's not, no reckoning. I reckon one of the only countries where the first peoples aren't recognised in their, in their stupid little book. And don't get me wrong, I do get, like once again, this, like on my journey to get to wearing this T-shirt, um, that whole, what does it mean to our sovereignty to, be, to agree to get, to put a sentence in your, in your little book? I'm just like, oh yeah, what does that mean to our sovereignty? Um, but I think I, I've come to the, uh, to, the, to the understanding that actually our sovereignty was never negotiable, it was never given, it has never been ceded. And I, I do understand that and, you know, um, so, so, yeah, but even more critically important is, is getting back to the principle. The principle of what, what do we stand for as a country? and to be able to stand tall and proud of and alongside the first peoples of this country. And I, one of the other questions that always comes to my mind with this conversation is, is what, are, what are we, what, who do we want to be? Because we're certainly not there now. But who do we want to be as a country? And in, in my little brain, I'm just like, imagine being in a country that celebrated its First Nations cultures that every school knew the, knew the mobs whose country they were on, they'd even been doing language lessons, they all knew the language, they all, I mean, we're seeing little skerricks of it, like we're starting to get little tastes of it and you go, oh my God, that's the good. But what if we could get to that place where we truly 
centred Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in their rightful place as the first peoples of this country. And we as a country could celebrate that and all be enriched by that. I mean, that again, <laughs> that, that again for me is such a simple concept. So, so underlying this conversation around what are you going to do when you, if, or well, those who haven't pre-voted, oh, I was going to pre-vote and I haven't done it yet. But anyway, you know, like as you, as you more importantly, when you're, you're not only, a, what, you know, when you're ticking that box, but actually the conversations you have with your family and the conversations you have with your friends and especially the ones that are like, oh, uh, you know, the, the, that, that we are all, we all hold a responsibility and, I, and that was what got me off the fence as well. It was like, could I look at myself in the friggin' mirror if, if this is a no vote and I did nothing about it? At least I can say I friggin' I, I tried, you know, and I was a part of the conversation. So, you know, I'm like, yeah, absolutely, we need to, all of us, go and, you know, you know, 100 people, go and get those 100 people out, you know, talking, talking, because it's... The, yeah, I mean, now I'm going to bitch because that, that unbelievable bullshit politics that we've all been experiencing, amplified a thousandfold by the, by the, by the pathetic media that we have in this country. And, and it just, I'm just like, oh my Lord, how is this, how is it, how is it, how is it so effective? The, you know, and I'm, I'm having nightmare flashbacks again about the children over bored hysteria bullshit. And, and the horrendous that we're still living in the aftermath of the treatment of people who come to our country wanting as asylum, we're still treating them the way we're treating them. And it started there with those children overboard and that government. And it was just like, how do we allow the hysteria and the fear mongering to be so powerful? It's so, it's so scary to me that that, that, that that is so powerful. I mean, the people I'm, I'm not going to talk about it, other, and I will never understand is the is the idiots down the far that far other. Um, the, this mob I can understand, and the warriors, the so, the black sovereignty movement. I can understand why they they're going no, mind you, they have they've changed. Them. Everyone knows, yeah, they they're now coming out. They realise that we can't. What we can't have is a no outcome for this country. And, and a point that was made to by, by a, an elder, a Palawa elder, he made the point, which was really actually was the big catalyst that, to get me off the fence. He was going, okay, we know it's an advisory body. It's not what we want. It's not nearly enough of what, what, what needs to happen in terms of having uh, self-determination and authority over who we are as a people in, our own, in determining our own affairs. It's not. It's a, it's a tiny little step towards that. Um, yes, there's questions around what this means to our sovereignty. It certainly doesn't acknowledge our sovereignty and it doesn't have the word, we acknowledge your sovereignty, so we don't have that. But what we, what we do need to talking, talking about is, well, is the bigger conversations, is, it, is about acknowledging our sovereignty, is about treaty and agreement making. Um, so there's the big conversations that do need to be had, which will not happen if, if this door is closed. And we know that, hey, this government, this government, this, this tiny little moment in time where we've got a government whose opening speech was, I stand by the Uluru Statement. It was phenomenal. It was such a profound moment as a black fella to hear that, that opening sentence, the first thing he stood for. So, you know, here we are, this moment, this little moment, this rare moment in time, to have to step forward as a nation, a tiny little goddamn step as, as at that, but it's a step forward. But more worse, more dangerous than that is if we don't take that little step, because then that door gets slammed shut and locked and bolted for God knows how many decades before the conversation is able to be back on the table. You know, is it going to be another children overboard asylum seeker hysteria that goes on for decades, rippling on for decades to come and no, everyone's too scared to touch it like tax reform? You know, so... <laughs> so... Anyway, I think that's actually all I've got to say. But I now wear this Yes T-shirt um, with, with great verve. 
Uh, I think this is a rare moment in time. I think we have to be brave and step forward, but I think we also have to be really proactive and go out and talk to all our mates and family um, because, you, you know, yeah, the, the black fellas in the room, our vote doesn't matter, but the other 97% in the room, your, your vote does matter. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Rachel. Rachel, don't get too comfy because I'm going to invite you back to a red chair. And Aretha, if you could join us, please. We've got a few minutes for questions. Um, can we have Mark join us on the magic box and uh, see if that works? And the way we're going to um, manage questions, we won't be able to have questions for Janelle, unfortunately, but... Um, the way we're going to manage questions is that we've got some roving mics and if you have a question, raise your hand, I will identify you and a microphone will magically appear to you. So who would like to ask a question of our panellists about the arts and the referendum? Yeah, please. Just Thank you. This has just been the most powerful evening ever <laughs> and I don't just mean about this particular referendum the things that have been spoken about are just phenomenally important and what I've been fighting for in my own personal life and I think you know any of the me too movements the white ribbon campaigns what you've all put forward is is profound as a white woman I went through the same process of could I could I wear a T-shirt? Could I wear a badge? Not because I didn't think that First Nations should be recognised, but because how the hell do you want to be recognised in a constitution that has got nothing to do with you, in inverted commas, sorry. So my, I think there are many of us who actually had that from different perspectives and where myself and number of girlfriends who I've chatted to got to was it's fucking arrogant of us to presume to know better for anyone else than you know for yourself. And if you're asking for it, I'm behind you, sister, excuse the use of that expression. Young and old, both of you on the, on the um, forum is, is just amazing. And the constitution, sorry, I will, the constitutional perspective is again one of the most profound. I hope this is going to be circulated wide. My question is, how can I as a white woman make sure that my grandchildren are as included in this conversation, other than by speaking to them myself, because walking both sides is what we leave as our legacy in voting yes. So how, how do you want us to get out there and make sure that our grandchildren collectively have the best future. <laughs> Do you want to go first? Yeah, no. I, well, I'll only to say um, there's yeah, just that this is that that's not a black solution. Like I don't have the answer for you know. Like I, I, I this is where it keeps coming back to. Everybody carries carries their responsibility um, and there's such a big conversation around that isn't there um, I, um, I ju just wanted to say though I, I do under I the and particularly down down here in Victoria and uh, where the comp debate has been really ferocious uh, in a kind of good way actually to be honest uh, you know the, the strong voices that have been coming from the from the progressive no the the black sovereignty um, staunch warriors um, has has been has been so kind of um, uh, understandably ferocious, and I, I do. I, I was thinking that's a bad word, but I, no, it's it's coming from two hundred and thirty-five years of rage. Like I absolutely get it. Um, anyway, anyway, I t I totally digressed, but um, yeah, yeah, the. I would like the 97% to be staunch in their support and, uh, and it's not going to be easy. Sometimes it, it yeah, uh, uh, actually, um, 
the, that the, t the, the fear of getting it wrong or uh, the, the, it, there's gonna there needs there's definitely got to be a period of um, not not yes anyway I'm, I'm articulating really badly um, standing staunch in your conviction and being prepared to to cop it from all sides <laughs> <laughs> uh, the tiptoeing is not what's working and I I'm, I'm I'm talking to myself even sitting back and and being too you know, like, oh, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to commit either way. I'll just decide on the day was basically my approach. And I realised that that was piss, <laughs> you know, that was piss week. Um, and actually that's not going not gonna to be, the, that's not a who I want to be and it's not the country I want to be. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, each of us just make a stand and you might get someone yelling you down the street, but so be it. Stand your ground and argue your case. <laughs> so. Nodding and it looked like you wanted to say something. Oh, sorry, Mark. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes, very well. Uh, Rachel, um, oh my God, every time I'm around you, if people do not really connect with your storytelling as a lived experience, then they're silly because, gee whiz, um, you provide energy and clarity but also the ability to um, take these very serious issues and put the responsibilities where they need to be. And I might go to why I want to answer that question um, to the uh, lady who um, asked the question. Only white people can understand what it means to be the best version of themselves. We can't guide you on how to be white, good white people or good non-Indigenous people. That's your job. Um, and so my request is to listen to our matriarchs, listen to our Rachels, listen to the ancestors who go, you do you, boo, and don't. We've got enough to contend with by keeping our people, our country nourish to the point of we can survive. Um, so one of the requests I would put off on you is to take the burden off us to be an expert on you. And you take up that mantra and that mantle of being, what does it mean to you to be the best white version for you? And that's what you should pass to your grandchildren. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, please. Rachel, Aretha, Mark, we're nine days, I'm guessing, from the referendum. We all are hoping for a particular outcome. If we don't get that outcome, how do we support you and our other First Nations artists to get through that and to keep working together to get a better outcome the next time or to keep pushing. What do you need from us? Well, the first thing I would say is we're already living in the know now. So actually it's just more of the same. I mean, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a step backwards because it's not a step forward and, it's a, and, and it'll be a, have been a missed opportunity that, like I said, that door will be closed for God knows how long. But actually we've become experts in living in the know and navigating this space. So, um, yeah, once again, I don't think it's a, that's gonna be just a black issue. I seriously think all of us are gonna be seriously um, compromised and, and have, have, had, have experienced a missed opportunity. We're gonna have more of hearing about the gap and more of hearing about the inc rates of incarceration all of us are going to have to keep listening to that shit because nothing's going to change. Yeah. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. It sounds. It feels so simple. Like I, I, I you know, that if, a, if 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 a kid was to, if you were talk to talk to your five year old niece or nephew, it would be so simple. That like what we're talking about here. 
this, this a country that is able to kind of acknowledge its history, celebrate its present. I mean, and, and yeah, and, and, if, and if anything, the, what's really at stake here is, is the planet. <laughs> like in, in all seriousness, they've, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are the only human race that's been able to exist sustainably in a balanced way on this planet for well over 65,000 years, 80, 127 years, according to that dig down in Warrnambool. Like, how, who else? Everybody else uh, built their shit and their water dikes and then self-combusted, ran out of water and all, all died. Not this country, sustainably, in balance. Like, if, if the experts about how we're gonna survive this planet are right here on this country. So we just gotta start listening. Um, this is the last opportunity for a question. Okay, I've got a question then. This is a question for Mark. Oh, it's not really a question, but Mark, I just wondered if you wanted to share anything about art, you know, given that your expertise is actually in constitutional law. And um, I just wondered if you had any reflections, you know, listening to the words of Janelle, Rachel and Aretha, if you had any reflections about the relationship between art and this referendum that you, that you wanted to share. I thought I'd just, you may not have anything to share, but I thought I'd give you the opportunity. Thank you. Um, I, and I will round off by giving the mic back to Aretha because I think there's a couple of things about what does it mean now to be an exhausted artist when you carry so much responsibility because art is the most profound and important marker of any civil society, uh, whether it's visual, whether it's performance, wh whatever art form is a reflection, a statement, an activism of a moment in time. Um, and Rachel and Aretha have been so eloquent in saying we're exhausted by keeping having to perform to the difficulties. And now we've got the possibility of another big difficulty, yet it will be art that drives the situation or the commiseration. Um, and it will be art that will actually be, I think, need to rescue Australia from the fuckwittery that these white nut jobs um, in the conservative movement of this country um, have really continued to force upon us. Because as a gay man, um, we lived this shit not so long ago when some fuckwit decided that it was okay to hold a postal val ballot about our existence and so what we had then was people actually engaged in conversation that we could hear not participate in because that's the power of um, heteronormativity but we got to witness people asking us well what do you want us to do for you it's like and then you had the no vote from a conservative point of view going, oh, you know, there was such a substantial amount of no voters, they've still got to be heard. It's like, that is not the fucking way democracy works. It's either yes or no. And so what you can see the conservatives doing in this one again is going, oh, well, we'll create enough of a conservative no, so we will never put this, bed to, this to bed again. Um, and it goes back to Aretha's point of, who is the villain here, but also who is the guide, who is the, um, the, who possesses the ability to make sense and articulate it back, and that is artists and creatives. So um, as a non-creative, boring lawyer, um, I, I am so thankful that we have creatives like Rachel and Aretha that can help us as Aboriginal people mop up the damage that has been talked about. And I also want to support 
the crea- the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander creatives as sovereign beings that every time that they go into their art form, that they are doing that in the practice of their sovereignty. Not It's not so- sovereignty never ceded. It is sovereignty always practised. And the best way that I feel um, that... Because I think artists are the most brave people in any culture, but in particular ours, because they put themselves up there to be not just listened to, but, you know, we all know that they become the subject of people's um, ire. So um, I am hopeful that there is a yes vote for the very reasons that our Palawa elder um, says is that, you know, we this isn't perfect, but we know as a people's multiple what the shitstorm is going to come down at us if this is no. It might be a mirror for white people, but white people don't, through their privilege, don't have to carry the responsibility. It will be blamed on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who didn't agree. It'll be blamed on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people for not working hard enough to convince non-Indigenous people that this is in our interest. Um, And yet, I think it's going to be the artists, our sovereign Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists, who are going to have to make sense of this for everyone. So I hope it's a yes vote, and then we can support our sovereign artists to actually make sense of that for the whole of Australia and the whole of the world, to be quite honest. But I think this is artists like Aretha's time to actually go, well, what does your future look like? Um, And how do you want us to support you creating your art through all of this. Aretha, would you would you like to respond to that or? Uh, sure. <laughs> um, oh, it's so many so many good questions. Um, I think just to address the lady that was asking the one about yeah, kind of what to um, kind of do to get your grandchildren interested. I think. Yeah. Sure. Sure. I think um, that's just kind of the thing. I think is that young people were always kind of being spoken to, though. It's it's this kind of this thing of we actually just need to listen to young people as well. Full stop. Um, <laughs> I'm sick of being told what to do, and that's why I like making art. Um, so it's actually listening again. We listen to our matriarchs and our elders. Very important always. But we also got to listen to young people too because we we have a voice and it is actually really important because it's our futures at stake um, ultimately. Um, and number two, best advice: write some. If you got an Aboriginal friend in your life, write some emails for them. It's it's, it's that simple. If you know an Aboriginal person, they probably have some emails. They need you to help write because that is my whole life. It's just emails. <laughs> always emails. <laughs> Every Aboriginal person, we have too many freaking emails. If you want to do anything as an ally, find your friend, say, hey, I'm going to give you from 10 to 12 Tuesday, I'm going to help you, I'm going to write all your emails. You just tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. You think I'm joking as well. I'm not even, that's not even a joke. You think I'm, that's bureaucracy for you. That's like the whole thing. I'm not even kidding. Every Aboriginal person will have an email that they need written. That's it. That's, that's all you're going to do as an ally. It's your language. You, <laughs> use it. Write some emails. I feel like the only reason I've ever been able to do anything in my life is because some white person has helped me write an email to do it. So <laughs> you got to help us out, you know. And that's that's kind of you know I joke about it, but it is ultimately what you got to do, you know. It's like finding those really annoying bureaucratic things that mob find difficult because uh, they're white systems and doing it because you're white and it's kind of your system. Um, so write an e- write those emails for your um, Aboriginal friends, you know. Um, yeah, that's kind of my advice. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, yeah. Um, I'm going to bring the evening to a close, uh, really, to, to Mark, Janelle, Aretha, Rachel, um, Nick, um, and, and of course, John Wayne Parsons. Just, I don't know how else to say it, but please accept our love our thanks, our gratitude for who you are, for what you share so willingly with us. It is, I, I, sometimes I wake up and I go, I cannot believe what I get to do. And this is one of those days. Um, 
you know, to the 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 the, the the level of generosity that's been presented to us this evening is just, it's, it's extraordinary. It's like the warmest blanket of love. Um, and, and I just, on behalf of everyone here and everyone in Zoom land, I can't thank you enough for that. Please join me in thanking you. Um, there is... There is another person to thank. There are, look, there are many people to thank, but you know, if you've contributed to this event, I ask you to hear yourself, uh, hear yourself being acknowledged in my next thanks. And I, he's going to get really embarrassed when I ask him to stand up. But if, if uh, Ashley Perry, okay, just don't stand up. Then just wave from there. I, you know, I, I get to be the person that hosts this, but he is the person that came to me and invited me on this extraordinary privilege. Uh, to give you a sense of who Ash is, he, um, he's an extraordinary artist who did his undergrad and uh, honours and masters with us here at the VCA and is dedicating, um, you know, the next while he's working in the repatriation area of museums and collections with the University of Melbourne. He's an extraordinary human being. And Ash, just on a personal note, thank you for knocking on my door and saying, David, would you be part of this, please? It's just extraordinary. Thank you. And then to finish the evening, please, please make welcome the wonderful, wonderful John Wayne Parsons to take us out. Wow, what an evening. I think um, between these two or three deadly speakers, I've, I've, I think I've come to a conclusion too, where I'm going and voting. It has been a struggle and much contention in our communities. I'm also um, a student and a worker at Melbourne University and especially through the VCA. I did a foundation in music here and now I'm at the end of submitting a PhD very shortly, probably at the end of this week. <laughs> Thank you. It has been a journey and with, without those Deadly white fellas helping me with some emails and some tutoring. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Write those emails. That really stuck out. And the you do you boo, oh, that really hit me. <laughs> but I'd like to close this event. There's so many voices that we're hearing and things that we might be struggling with their own self. I think we need to sit and that's why I love song. That's my sovereign space. It's, it's malleable. So all the conversation, all the noise that we hear in the media, this is your opportunity through this song. It's a special song to me. It's from the Torres Straits. And it talks about the ocean. So if I can have that visual up there, help us with that imagery. This is called Terge. And if you have ever been down by the water's edge and you see those waves roll in, just imagine the roar within that wave. The sound. It would be deafening. And as that water rolls in, and crashes up against the reef or against the rocks. I like to think those sprays are the voices of my ancestors. What are they saying to me in this moment? What are your ancestors saying? This is Terge. Another thing, I look at some of those empty seats. They aren't empty to me. Because a wonderful other musician by the name of Uncle Kutcher Edwards, he said when he gets up on stage, 
He can visualise his ancestors sitting in every one of those empty seats. And they say, and boy or son, you sing that song in language. That's my boy up there telling that other ancestor next to him. That's my boy. He's singing our language. That language belongs to these countries. Many languages across this beautiful place of Australia. This is Terge. Galil 